Hello, my name is Antonio. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the SWAT Group, University of Granada. In this video, we will explain you the radiation mechanism of antennas and some practical issues related to the measurement process in an anechoic chamber. An antenna is a metallodielectric device that transmits and receives electromagnetic waves. More specifically, an antenna can be seen as a transitional structure between free space and a guiding device, as illustrated in the figure. Conventional antennas possess an interesting property. Their radiation characteristics are identical when transmitting and receiving electromagnetic waves. This is known as reciprocity theorem. There are many types of antennas. Nonetheless, the different ways of radiating can be generally classified into three main classes, isotropic, omnidirectional and directive patterns. Isotropic antennas radiate the same amount of energy in all space directions. For this reason, their radiation pattern has the shape of a perfect sphere. Although this kind of antennas cannot be found or made in single elements, they serve as a theoretical reference to simplify the study of antenna arrays. When characterizing linear antennas, it is a common practice to work with two-dimensional cuts of the original three-dimensional pattern. In particular, we normally pay attention to the E and H planes. The E plane contains the direction of the electric field and the direction of the propagating energy. Similarly, the H plane contains the direction of the magnetic field and the direction of the propagating energy. Note that in the case of isotropic antennas, E and H planes are vertical and horizontal cuts of a sphere, so they are perfect circles. Those antennas whose radiation pattern present symmetry of revolution around one of the main axes are classified as omnidirectional. Omnidirectional patterns can be found in wire or cylindrical antennas and in some kind of loops. Here, the energy is radiated equally in all horizontal directions, sharing some similarities in that sense with isotropic patterns. In the case of omnidirectional antennas, the E and H planes are different. The electric field is oriented parallel to the wire antenna. Thus, the E plane corresponds to the vertical plane in this configuration. On the other hand, the magnetic field is perpendicular to the wire, so the H plane corresponds to an horizontal cut of the three-dimensional pattern. Those elements that radiate in a single specific region of space are known as directional or directive antennas. Unlike previous examples, directive antennas do not distribute all the energy equally in all directions, but concentrate it in a specific direction. An example of directive radiating element can be found in jaggy antennas, the kind of antennas placed on rooftops to receive the television signal. To determine how directive an antenna is, a parameter called gain is defined. The greater the gain, the more directive the antenna is. Within the radiation pattern, we can observe a region where the radiation is maximum, the so-called main lobe. The areas of smaller amplitude surrounding the main lobe are the secondary lobes. Secondary and back lobes represent undesired radiation so they must be minimized in directional antennas. Once the theoretical foundations have been set, now we will continue with a practical example. We are at the measuring facilities of the SWAT group, inside the anechoic chamber. An anechoic chamber is a metallic enclosure coated with microwave absorbers in order to avoid reflections in the metallic walls. In this case, we will try to measure the radiation properties of this kind of horn antenna, a directive antenna widely used in wireless communication systems. This is the equipment we are using in the measurement, a vector network analyzer that can operate from 10 MHz to 67 GHz, a calibration kit that will help us to eliminate losses introduced by cables and other elements, a laser to align the antennas, and the transmitting and receiving horn antennas, both identical, that operate from 33 GHz to 50 GHz. Just in the case of working above the maximum frequency of the vector network analyzer, let's say at 100 or 200 GHz, 
some frequency multipliers will be needed. In the SWAT group, we have frequency multipliers that allow to extend the limit of the measurement up to 300 GHz. These devices will be detailed in the following videos. When measuring the radiation properties in the anechoic chamber, the first step is to check that both transmitting and receiving antennas are perfectly aligned. This is done thanks to the alignment laser available in our facilities. Normally, the radiation regions of an antenna can be divided into near field and part field. These regions determine how close the measured field is with respect to the emitting source. The start of the far field zone can be calculated analytically. For the dimensions of the considered antenna, its far field region is located approximately at 20 cm. It is important to know this distance as most of the manufactured antennas are optimized to operate in far field, as in our case. Once the antennas are perfectly aligned and its operation is fixed in the far field, we will proceed to the measurement. In this case, we will characterize the H plane of the transmitting horn antenna, which corresponds to an horizontal cut of the three dimensional pattern. The transmitting antenna is positioned on a moving table that is freely to rotate in the azimuth direction. With the help of the vector network analyzer and a processing software, we annotate the amplitude level of the received signal at each azimuth position, ranging from minus 90 to 90 degrees from the center. Thus, we can progressively construct the radiation pattern of the transmitting hot antenna in its edge plane. When two linearly polarized antennas, such as the ones we are using, are rotated 90 degrees from each other, it is expected that zero power is transferred between the antennas. This is known as polarization mismatch. In practice, this value will not be exactly zero, so a parameter called cross-polarization is defined. This parameter determines the purity of the considered polarization. In the present scenario, we rotate 90 degrees the transmitting antenna and measure that quite amplitude level. As observed, the received amplitude is much less compared to the previous measurement, indicating that the cross-polarization term is quite small. This is a comparison of the measured H-plane at 38 GHz in both copolar and cross-polar components after post-processing the results. Note that the covalent term corresponds to the case where the antennas are perfectly aligned. It can be observed that the radiation pattern of a whole antenna is directional, one of the three main classes that we defined at the beginning. This means that the whole antenna mainly radiates the energy in a single a specific region of space, in this case, in the direction in which the antenna is pointing. By taking a closer look to the blue curve, we can observe the main lobe at 0 degrees and the secondary lobes at 50 and minus 50 degrees. Note that the amplitude of the secondary lobes is much less compared to the main lobe. Furthermore, we have also plotted in the graph the measured value of the cross-polarization term. Ideally, this value should be much less compared to the copolar term. In antenna community, from a practical point of view, we assume that the antenna has perfect linear polarization if this value is 30 dB below the value of the copole component in the direction of the maximum radiation. As observed at 0 degrees, this value is 35 dB below the maximum radiation peak. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more content.